Good afternoon, everybody. I think one of the badges is of successful ageing is being able to manage without the trams. So I do commend your ingenuity and ability in that regard. A warm welcome to you to the second of the successful ageing seminars for 2019. I guess it's on a topic that's very close to all of us. I doubt that there would be a person here who doesn't know somebody who's had a diagnosis of cancer or perhaps been touched by cancer themselves. That leads me, I guess, to just drawing to your attention the brochure on the University of South Australia's Cancer Research Institute, and particularly um, the researchers that are involved in um, continuing the fight against cancer. And you'll see some lovely little vignettes about our two eminent researchers. I'm losing this from time to time, so I'll see how I go. Um, looks like Donna will give me very much, Donna. Can you hear me at the back? Yes, marvellous. That's great. I'm Ruth Grant. I have the privilege of being the MC to the Successful Ageing Seminars, and I get a great deal of pleasure out of this, and a great deal of pleasure seeing many familiar faces and also new faces today as well. So a warm welcome to you all. If you have a hearing device, um, we have hearing sets at the front but also you could ch uh, turn your hearing device to the T setting as there's a hearing loop uh, in this theatre. Before, before we start, though, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the land of the Ghana people and that we recognise and respect their cultural beliefs, their cultural heritage and their relationship with the land. A few housekeeping uh, notes. First of all, I wonder if you would turn your mobile phones to silent or turn them off. Um, toilets are from the, going down through the front. Um, the male toilets are to the left and the female toilets to the right. Also to mention that we do very much um, enjoy having your feedback. You may have picked up some feedback forms as you came in at the table um, and do uh, give us feedback. And if you haven't picked one up, please do and fill it in at your leisure. Thank you very much. So now to continuing the fight against cancer. I've mentioned the booklet and I think many of you have it and I'll just mention it and put it down again. Hearing today from two very highly respected researchers, uh, Professor Stuart Pitson and also Professor Peter Hoffman. Let me talk a little bit about Professor Stuart Pitson before he comes to speak to us. Peter is involved very much, Stuart, I'm so sorry, Stuart is involved very much in um, the, not, a, not the identification of brain cancer or brain tumours, but in the treatment of brain tumours. There are many aggressive brain tumours in children. The medulloblastoma is one, and in the uh, adults, uh, glioblastoma. And cancer cells metabolise fat, fats differently from other cells. And it's that knowledge um, that Professor uh, Stuart Pitson is working on to develop targeted drug therapies, targeted medication therapies, to help to treat these aggressive brain cancers. Stuart is a research leader in the Centre for Cancer Biology, which is a joint initiative between SA Pathology and the University of South Australia. He's also the Foundation Professor of Brain Tumour Research, the Neurosurgical Research Foundation Foundation Professor. We look forward very much to hearing what Stuart has to say in such an important area of interest to us all. Thanks very much, Stuart. All right. So 
So, okay. Um, no. I put it right up to my mouth. All right. Um, sorry. <laughs> All right. How about now? Good. <clears throat> So yeah, I want to tell you, tell you today uh, a bit about our research in, in brain tumours. Talk a little bit about what brain tumours are, uh, and what our efforts are in terms of trying to understand the brain tumours better and develop methods to screen, develop better drug therapies, and also some of our research in, in, in developing those new drugs. But first, I just want to give you a scenario. Imagine a 21-year-old boy, man. He's in the third year of, of university. He's at the peak of his physical prowess. He's a football uh, star. He's got a, a beautiful girlfriend. He's in third year of university. He's doing incredibly well, uh, top, almost topping his class. Uh, but in, in April of, of the third year of his, his degree, he goes for a bike ride. Inexplicably, he falls off the bike, hits his head. He's got a helmet on, so it's not such a, a bad thing, but uh, he's fallen off because he's had a dizzy spell. He's, he's gone off to the, the doctor, or his girlfriend's taking him off to the doctor, and they're more concerned about the dizzy spells than perhaps the crack on the head from the, uh, from the bike ride because he's been having these dizzy spells for a few weeks. Turns out he goes for an MRI just to check, just a simple check. Nothing's going to happen. MRI, turns out he has a brain tumour. And it turns out to be an incredibly aggressive brain tumour. Later, he's not with us anymore. So this is a story of one of my friends uh, at university, uh, and it's, it probably motivates me more than anything else to, to try and actually find a, a cure for, for brain tumour. So... <clears throat> Fortunately, this is a, a common story. We, we have a lot of uh, patients and patient families through our uh, Centre for Cancer Biology labs uh, across the road here. Uh, and, you know, it, it seems a very common story that these brain tumours are, are incredibly aggressive and they, and they take patients incredibly fast and uh, in a really distressing way. And I think, you know, all cancers are scary, but I think... I find particularly the brain tumours are, are particularly scary because it doesn't uh, just end up killing you, but it also takes away a lot of your ability to think, communicate, and, uh, and that's a particularly scary thing because these brain tumours uh, basically affect uh, the way that you function. All right, so let me tell you a little bit of a story uh, of, of, some, of brain tumours and what they are. So there are more than 120 types of brain tumours. There are uh, secondary brain tumours that I won't really talk too much about today, um, but these are essentially arise from tumours that are in other parts of the body. So uh, lung or a breast tumour uh, will metastasize. so part of that tumour or a few cells from that tumour will break off, go into the bloodstream and end up lodging in the brain and forming a tumour. So these are, um, are often the reason for, uh, for death uh, of many uh, of these Patients that are suffering lung and, and uh, breast tumour, not always, but they, but they are a particularly difficult type of tumour to, to treat. They're not classically brain tumours uh, because they haven't derived from brain tissue, but they are uh, a tumour growing in the brain. And, and generally they're treated in a similar way to the uh, original tumour, uh, but the trouble is that the brain has some safety mechanisms to stop a lot of the classical drugs getting across the blood, this, this fight from the bloodstream into the brain. It's called something called the blood-brain barrier, and it stops these drugs getting into the brain. So they can be particularly difficult to treat. The other form of brain tumour that we mainly look at are, are primary brain tumours. Now, they're called primary because they arise from the brain cells themselves. These um, can be benign, meaning that they're they're not particularly invasive, uh, they'll, but they'll grow as a tumour, so they'll grow as a mass in the brain, um, or they can be malignant, where they actually do start to invade surrounding tissue and, and uh, take over the normal brain. Now, of course, in a breast, a benign tumour is not a big 
stress for the for the patient because it's a benign mass that can normally be taken out and is is not a, a big deal. But of course, in the brain, if you have a mass that's growing uh, in the brain, it's a pretty enclosed environment, and that and that mass of uh, non-functional cells can actually cause its, uh, problems itself. So benign brain tumors are, are not a uh, 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 anything that is exposed. So if we look at the different types of brain tumors uh, listed up here, uh, there, are, as you can see, there's a lot of different, these are primary brain tumors, a lot of different primary brain tumors. Now, <clears throat> the one here in the, uh, in the green on the, on the left are called meningiomas. Now, these are the most common primary bra brain tumor. They're not classically a brain, well, they are a brain tumor because they grow in the brain, but they're, they're basically tumors that grow on the membranes that cover the, the, the brain itself. It's a huge number of people have them, but they're actually benign tumours. And in most cases, patients that have been diagnosed with those are actually happened at autopsy when they've died from something else. So they're not actually a tumour that commonly causes a problem, unless it gets particularly big and it then starts causing pressure on the rest of the brain. The ones I really want to focus on today uh, are the ones over here on the right in blue, uh, which are glioblastomas. So these are really aggressive, nasty brain tumours um, that almost invariably cause death of the patients. There's a whole lot of other uh, primary brain tumours. These are ones that are in adults. There are a different spectrum of brain tumours that happen in kids. Okay. <clears throat> so the, the reason there are lots of different um, types of brain tumours, uh, the, these, these primary brain tumours, as I said, derive from the cells in the brain. So something's happened in a normal cell in the brain, some genetic defect is, has arisen that's caused that normal cell to form a tumour, not grow properly. So you can see this is just a, a schematic, it's complicated, but it, it's it just to show you that there's lots of different uh, types of cells in the brain. It's not just all neurons. There are other things like astrocytes that are in the orange there that are uh, essentially support cells. Uh, for the neurons, there are oligodendrocytes and, uh, and a number of other cells. And these defects can occur in any of those cells and they will form different types of tumours that have different characteristics and different, different challenges in, in treatment. Ones that the glioblastomas uh, generally arise from the, from the astrocytes. So what are the, the risk factors in... Uh, I often get asked this, what are the risk factors? What can we do to prevent uh, getting brain tumours? Well, there are lots of different risk factors proposed. You've probably heard about mobile phones and uh, you know, various other things. Generally, there's really little, e well, no evidence to suggest that mobile phones can cause brain tumours. No proper evidence. But, you know, there are, there are four risk factors, and I'll, I say risk factors very loosely here, um, uh, that have supporting evidence that, that they can increase your risk of, of getting brain tumour. One is ionising radiation, and that um, you need to have pretty high doses of this. So you would need... So if you lived in Hiroshima uh, as a child, uh, maybe a 10-year-old child around 1945, um, then you had an increased chance of, of getting brain tumours, so certain forms of brain tumours, largely these meningiomas, these benign brain tumours. Um, if you have uh, dental x-rays, uh, there's also a risk of, of increased risk of brain tumours from that, but you would need to have probably two a year for or in the excess of 30, 40, 40 years to, to, um, to have an increased risk. So really, x-rays, should, you should not try number three. <laughs> Right, really, don't avoid having dental x-rays if you need them, right? Because it's really a, a low risk. Another form of ionising radiation, though. So family genetics can contribute to some forms of brain tumour. Um, it's uh, probably less than 5% of all the brain tumours are, are linked to some family genetics, and often they're linked to other diseases that are, are occurring as well. Age, it's appropriate for this type of seminar that age is also a, a, a risk factor. Like pretty much every cancer most cancers, uh, as you get older, the risk of getting brain tumours increases as well. Fortunately, being male is also uh, a slight risk factor as well. Not much we can do about that in most cases. Um, but this is just a, a, an ex a, 
a chart that shows you uh, that sort of information spelled uh, out a bit more. So uh, the, the thinner dark blue lines are the incidence of, or, or the, rel the incidence of, of brain tumours in men, and the, the thinner blue, light blue line are those in women. So you can see that as you get older, um, there's an increased chance of getting a brain tumour. Uh, and it tends to be a little bit more common in males and females. You can also see the darker line is the, the mortality, the deaths that occur from brain tumours uh, in, in men. Uh, and you can see that, uh, again, there's uh, more men die from brain tumours, but that's made larger because more men get them, right? So, and, and you can see that these nines actually don't separate very much, suggesting that most people who have brain tumours uh, will die from, from the disease. What's not perhaps shown quite so well, you can see this increases as we age, um, but there's also really quite high, compared to most other cancers, quite high incidence of brain tumours you know, in the 20-year-olds 20, 20 and, and even in the zero to four um, age bracket. So, um, you know, this generally with most tumours, most cancers, you really don't have much incidence at all at this sort of, uh, these sorts of ages. So, this is one of the problems with brain tumours, is it can affect all ages. And particularly in children, um, there's certain forms of, of brain tumour that are, the children are born with uh, and, and really present sort of in that two to three year age bracket. And, uh, and while those, patients, those children have a, a better outcome, better likelihood of surviving um, than, than adult brain tumour patients, the arduous therapy they have to go through often leads to pretty um, devastating effects on their development. This is just showing uh, in, in ki children, uh, you know, it's really the, the top disease-related uh, uh, cause of death in, in children. So uh, brain tumours here, uh, only really beaten by um, car accidents uh, and uh, congenital uh, abnormalities. Uh, leukemia is probably the other main cancer that's caused here, but uh, that, that causes death in, in children, uh, but it's quite a bit less than uh, than brain cancer. So, how do we treat these brain tumours? Well, it it depends a lot on the the type of brain tumour, uh, and the the therapies uh, are quite quite different. What I really want to focus on on today, perhaps, is, is the most aggressive one, is glioblastoma, and and the way that these are treated really are. Uh, if possible, to remove through surgical intervention. So remove the tumour uh, uh, if possible, then treat with radiation and, and chemotherapy. I'll just go through some of those, uh, those things in a few minutes. So how common is it? So around 1,000 Australians, 80 South Australians are diagnosed with glioblastoma. So as, as you saw before, that's probably uh, a little over half of all those that have a malignant brain tumour. Uh, in Australia. If you compare, compare that to, say, breast cancer, I'm not sure you can see that very well, but there's about 17,000 cases of breast cancer diagnosed each year in Australia. <coughs> so it's not as common. But, and, and we look at breast cancer survival, is somewhere in the order of 90% uh, of, of patients will survive out to five years. Phenomenal increases in the ability to get these patients to survive over the last 20 years. You know. Think back 20, 30 years ago, the survival rate, five-year survival rate for breast cancer patients was in the order of 30%. So we've done phenomenally well in really increasing it up to 90%. When you compare that to glioblastoma patients, and they have a, a less than 5% survival rate after five years. Median survival is 15 months. That means that 15 months out from diagnosis, half of the patients that have been diagnosed And you can see here that you know, if you look at um, survival rates, you know, the blue line is, is this is from the, um, the federal government uh, stats, uh, the blue line is the survival rates of, um, five, five year survival rates of, of can all cancers, all patients with cancer. You see that line is going up, so it's going up from in the order of 45% uh, up to you know, probably more than, more than 60% survival over five years for, for all other cancers. But you look at that red line, and that's, that's brain tumours, not just glioblastoma, but all the brain tumours, and that just has remained stagnant. So, uh, 
all of the work that we've done in, in improving the survival of other cancer patients uh, has really come to naught uh, in terms of brain uh, cancer survival. So why is it so hard to treat? So this is 20% this is for all brain cancers, but remember it's 5% for, it's for, for glioblastoma. So, so why is it so hard to treat? Well, it's difficult to surgically remove all of the tumour. I mentioned that you know, surgical removal, chemotherapy and radiotherapy, the three uh, ways that these are treated. It's really difficult to remove all the tumour. So we often present brain tumours uh, looking like this. It's a nice discrete mass uh, in the brain, and yes, you've got to cut through that pretty sensitive uh, brain to be able to get to it, but you think, well, you should be able to take that out. Neurosurgeons should at least be able to take that out. Pretty clever people. But unfortunately, glioblastomas don't look like that in reality. They look more like this. This is a, uh, an MRI, and this white patch here is a glioblastoma. And you can see that it's fuzzy on the sides. It's, you know, it's not a nice, discrete tumour. It's invading into the surrounding tissue. And to be honest, this is actually a quite um, discrete tumour. Some of them are really just a cloud uh, that's all spread throughout the, uh, the brain. And I, having spoken to the neurosurgeons quite a lot, they, you know, they get into the brain and start trying to uh, take you know, the, the tumour out. And unfortunately, the tumour and the brain tissue are very similar in both look and in feel. And it's really difficult for them to, to, to get it out. They have, have some pretty advanced uh, imaging technology to be able to try and image the tumour uh, and take it out at the same time. But it's really, really almost... Im well, it is impossible to take all the tumour out in most cases. And of course, this is only where the tumour's in a position where you can actually operate on it. There are many places where it's in such a sensitive area you just can't operate at all. So this is a problem. You can't get it all out. And even I think the best case scenario the neurosurgeons will tell you is that they might be able to get 95% of the tumour out. And that's followed up with you know, radiotherapy and, and chemotherapy. The other problem is that there's... And I'll come to that in a moment. The other, other problem is that there's no easy or routine method of screening. <clears throat> so we can't... Like, there's no blood tests available to be able to screen for this. The only way, really, of doing it is an MRI. And, you know, MRIs are expensive, there's not that many around, and, and you just can't be going in to have MRIs all the time. It's a, and, you know, it's a, it's, if you have too many MRIs, there's always a chance of, of causing brain tumours. So you don't want to be having MRIs every six months, right? So, unfortunately, there's, there's no easy way of doing it. The other problem is that brain tumour symptoms, if you look at the, you know, there's headaches, fatigue, depression, I don't know about you, I probably felt most of those last week. Um, so, yeah, we, you know, they're the sort of early, early stages. So, um, it's really hard to tell. It's, it, even behavioural and cognitive changes, it's, it's sometimes, it's not easy to necessarily know. It's only when you start getting to perhaps the bottom ones, the seizures, um, you know, the sensory and nerve, nerve damage and the hearing loss or vision loss that you might actually start to think, well, I need to go to the doctor to check out what's going on. And by that stage, that generally means that the tumour has got to a reasonable size where it's actually starting to impact on the, the healthy brain around it and causing these, these symptoms. I need to emphasise, no, no, if you've got a headache, fatigue and depression, don't go to the doctor thinking you've got a brain tumour. 99.99 times out of 100, you won't. Um, so, yeah, it's really hard uh, up early, to pick them up early. My friend uh, who had uh, his brain tumour, uh, I guess he had started having the dizzy spells and that was his, uh, his marker and yeah, so the, the tumour had already got um, somewhere in the order of a golf ball size. So it was you know, quite an advanced tumour. So, and... And that's some, you know, it, it depends on where the tumour is as well. So you get different symptoms depending on where the tumour is. So sometimes you'll have a relatively small tumour that will cause some, uh, some changes that you can pick up, uh, and other times they can get quite large without actually causing any real problems until they get to huge sizes. Now, the other problem that's why these are so hard to treat is, is the blood-brain barrier. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is a, a, an adaption of, of the body to pretty much to stop... Uh, poisons and other toxins that you might eat, uh, getting from the bloodstream into the brain and damaging the brain. Trouble is that also stops a lot of drugs, nearly all drugs from getting, uh, you know, chemotherapy drugs from getting from the bloodstream into the brain. And that's a really major problem uh, of getting uh, better treatments is, is getting those drugs into the site, into the tumour in the brain. 
The other problem is the current drugs we have are not very good. No way around it, that's just the uh, main problem. The drugs that actually do get across the blood-brain barrier into the tumour in the brain just don't work very well, and I'll show you some, some data for that later on. Right, I'll show you some data now. So, um, so this is uh, some old data um, that from about 15 years ago um, that basically this was the, the lighter purple line is really where uh, patients were treated with surgery to remove most of the tumour and then radiotherapy. And so they had, and this is essentially their survival uh, in, in months after they, um, after they were treated. So you can see that um, pretty much most of the patients died you know, and, uh, fairly quickly and within roughly 12 months half of the patients were, had died. So this is what we call a median survival of 12 months. And really, out to 30 months, nearly all of them had died. Maybe 2 or 3% were still, still alive. Now, this is, this, is tem this is when we have temozolomides. This is one of the chemotherapies that it, uh, was the blockbuster drug. It was going to, you know, it, it, it's used universally now for, for glioblastoma patients. And it marginally increases survival. Yes, if you're in that, uh, you know, group that, that have has survived out to 36 months when you would have probably died earlier on, that's a fantastic outcome for you because, you know, that's an, any, any time extra is, is uh, precious. But really, it just doesn't work very well. I mean, we, the median survival has gone from 12 months to about 15 months. So a three-month increase in median survival is, is not, very, not very good. And yet, this is the blockbuster drug that was introduced 15, 15 years ago and is still in, in use today. Nothing's come to improve on this. And that's what we're trying to do. We, we need to try and improve on this because this is not good enough. So how do we, how do we improve on it? So there are various ways. Um, there are groups that are looking at trying to harvest viruses to try and kill the tumour cells. So these viruses can uh, be engineered to try and directly uh, infect the, tumor, the brain tumour cell. Um, there's some uh, stunning early trials with that and uh, it looks uh, very promising. Um, still a long way away I think from a therapy. There's immunotherapies, you've probably heard about immunotherapies, often used for, uh, for melanoma. Uh, so there are some uh, very promising immunotherapies, so you can take different ways of doing immunotherapy, but one of the ways that, that we're working with uh, collaborators over here at the Centre for Cancer Biology is to take the own, your own uh, immune cells, own T cells, uh, immune cells out of your body, modify them so they can now better work and better attack the tumour, and then reintroduce them back into the patient, uh, and uh, and then they can uh, they're engineered to basically attack the tumour, and they can work quite well. Again, there's some stunning early st trials with those, uh, and th and that's very promising. And then I th guess the probably the more, most likely approach to, to change things more quickly are new drugs. And so we need to improve drugs, um, yeah, need to get better drugs uh, fast. So that brings me to what we're trying to do. So this is my group. Handsome lot of people, aren't they? Um, so uh, I'll come back to talk about some of the ones that people who are actually doing uh, the brain tumour work in a moment. But really what our goals are is to try and um, improve screening technology or improve way approaches to, to develop new drugs. So what we're trying to do is establish a, a state-of-the-art living biobank of, of glioblastoma. So we're working with neurosurgeons, we're getting tumour samples uh, from the patients. The patients are uh, very um, graciously donating their tumour material to us. And we're trying to set up a, a living biobank of being able to grow those cells, those tumour cells in the laboratory uh, and so that we can then try and use those, the real tumour cells, and try and screen for new drugs, screen new drugs against those cells and see if we can kill those cells in the laboratory and in, and in uh, advanced models. We've done, uh, I'll show you some data on that in a moment. Um, so we're setting up, essentially that's what the next point is, is use these living biobanks to screen new and existing drugs and we're sort of really trying to set up to be the, the centre of, uh, within Australia at least and, and potentially the uh, southern hemisphere of really being able to screen for new drugs against these uh, and then, of course, we're trying to, to develop our own uh, new drugs, uh, uh, looking at, at fat metabolism, essentially, to try and target these glioblastomas. And I'm going to show you some data on that. But this is really our flowchart of what we're trying to do. We, we get um, 
tumour material from largely from Flinders at the moment via the South Australian Neurological Tumour Bank. Uh, we're also uh, beginning to get it from the uh, RA as well. And we take those, uh, we generate cells in the laboratory, so cultures of cells, and I'll show you some of those in a moment. Uh, we can also make organoids. These are these three-dimensional uh, cultures of cells. And again, I'll show you a picture of those in a moment. And these um, can grow a, a, a in the laboratory a, a, as uh, almost like it's one of the mini brains. And, and the idea is that they will represent sensitivity to drugs much better than the, the cell lines at the top. We also are generating uh, tumours in mice. We do do, we do do mouse work. We do this as a last resort. Um, uh, but, you know, it's, it's the only way that we can really try and progress drugs towards the clinic. And then we try and do a lot of genetic analysis. Really, at the moment, these tumours are not done. No genetic testing is really, in any meaningful way, is done on these tumours because everybody, every patient gets exactly the same treatment. They get surgery, they get radiation, they get temozolomide. It's the only chemotherapeutic. So there's not much point really testing genetically what is different about each tumour because each patient will get the same uh, therapy. But we're trying to sort of break that and say, well, we, you know, we want to do genetic analysis to try and understand what are the, the defects in these tumour cells you know, that, that we might be able to actually try and stratify you know, different patients in different ways and say, well, actually, you know, certain drugs may work for 5% you know, of patients, another drug may work for another 10% of patients. That's really the idea. Work with this is just the local people we work with, but there's a number of other groups within the Centre for Cancer Biology at Samri and at Samri, and uh, we're also working with other groups around the country. So this is sort of our flowchart of what we're doing. So we get tumour material. This is a bit of tumour material here. We also get this CUSA, which is um, as the neurosurgeons operate, they not, don't just use a scalpel, they, they use this ultrasonic um, probe to essentially liquefy the tumour. It's a very easy, a very precise way of being able to extract the tumour by liquefying it and then sucking it out. So we get this liquid that comes out and that actually has uh, tumour cells in it. And we're able to take, you know, mush up this solid tumour or take this liquefied tumour and we're able to grow these cells in the laboratory. So these are, each one of these little cells here are a cell, right? So we grow them under conditions that try and maintain their uh, properties of, of how they were in the, in the patient, in the tumour in the patient. They, so they're grown as these glioma neural stem cells, the GNS cells. And that's very much faithfully reproduces what, how those cells were in, in the patient. We do the genetic analysis and we can classify them into three different subtypes. Um, you know, again, that's not used clinically yet, but we're hoping to understand how how different drugs may interact with those different subtypes. You've probably heard about breast cancer. You know, there's, there are um, ER-positive breast cancers. They're often treated with uh, uh, tamoxifen. Uh, there are HER2-positive uh, breast cancers, which are treated with a different drug, and then there are triple-negative breast cancers. There are different types of breast cancer. They're all stratified into different subtypes, and, and the patients are given different treatments. That's where we're trying to head in this, in this space. Not just us, but uh, groups around the world as well, trying to head in that direction. We can grow these these cells as organoids. So these are this is a, a 3D. So this is a, uh, a less magnification, but this is you know, a, a few thousand cells all growing as this as this spheroid, as this uh, this uh, sphere of cells. And um, as I said, they can grow in the laboratory like that, and we can throw gr drugs on them, and they tend to respond much more like the original tumour than, than perhaps um, these individual cells here growing in, in, a, in a culture. We can also grow um, these, take these cells and implant them. We do neurosurgery ourselves, and we implant them into the, the brains of mice. Uh, once we see fantastic results in the... In, uh, these cultures in, in the laboratory, we uh, take it to the next level and, and try and actually see whether we can um, cure the tumours in mice. So we've got, with, we've had a great support from the Neurosurgical Research Foundation. Uh, we managed to purchase a stereotactic uh, rodent injection system. So this is this $45,000 worth of equipment here. Um, where we can actually do brain, brain surgery uh, in, in the mice. Very, very accurate brain surgery. It's all computer op operated. These are, uh, the screen here shows you a, a mouse brain and you can basically key in exactly where you want to 
uh, uh, operate on the on the tumor on the on the brain and, and in, insert the cells. We had uh, support to do advanced training in the U.S. So I sent two people to the U.S. to do uh, training in this technique, and and really they've become neurosurgeons in mice, but neurosurgeons all the same. So that's what they tell their partners. They go home. They tell everybody they're neurosurgeons now. And um, we also have, um, across the road here, we have some advanced uh, rodent imaging. So we can do bioluminescence imaging. I'll show you that in a moment, where we can basically label the cells with a, uh, uh, to, to make them glow. And then we can image those cells in the mice. We also do micro-CT, which is uh, essentially uh, an imaging technique that is also used on patients. Um, but there's a smaller, smaller version of it that we can do imaging on mice. And so we can then basically image the brains and look at the tumors growing. So this is a, an image, many people, many researchers will avoid showing mouse experiments because uh, of the fear of, of people having an ethical objection to, to doing mouse work. I understand that, um, but I think it's, it's also important to, to recognise that we only ever do mouse work when we absolutely need to and when we have a pressing need where we have a fantastic result in the laboratory, we can't just go straight into humans, we need to be able to test these things in animal. Um, so uh, our mouse, our mice are our, our faithful little friends that, that help us out in that, in that space. And that, they are treated incredibly well and um, we, we value their input in, into the research incredibly. So these, you see here, these are these glowing cells that are growing as tumours, these brain tumour cells from a patient that we've managed to um, modify so that they, they glow. Uh, and so we can, these are gr growing as tumours inside the brain of, of, the, of the mouse. So we've made a small in, uh, drill hole in the, in the skull. We've uh, made a very small, fine needle into the brain, inserted these cells. The cells have grown as a tumour in the brain uh, and um, these are grown uh, to a reasonable size before we start uh, therapy on the, on the mice. So, okay, so that's really what our setup of the resources that we've been uh, working to try and set up to, to provide a resource for brain tumour researchers uh, in Adelaide and, and around the country. So some of our research, though. Um, so we work on, uh, as Ruth said before, on, on really on fat metabolism. So these brain tumour cells metabolise fats and lipids in a, in a different way to, uh, to normal, normal brain cells. And actually, there's quite a lot of fatty material in the brain. Um, it's probably one of the most concentrated areas where there are sort of lipids and, and, and fats. So, um, so it, it makes sense that uh, if this is modified, this, this metabolism of lipids is, is defective, that can contribute towards brain tumour progression. So here is a schematic, a very, very basic schematic of a, of a cell. This is outside the cell. This is inside the cell. This is the membrane that encases the cell. And this is our target of interest, sphingosine kinase 2. We'll just call it SK2 because nobody can say sphingosine kinase 2 very well. So we've been working for about 15 years on this protein. It's a, like research is a, a long haul. But um, what we found, I guess, in that time is that there are mutations that occur in normal cells that can come and they can activate this SK2 protein. What that does is it makes it highly active and makes it go towards the periphery of the cell. When it's at the periphery of the cell, it makes these signals. They're, called, they're actually lipids, but it makes these signals that can come out of the, it can basically signal inside the cell to increase cancer cell division, migration and survival, or they can go outside, be released outside the cell, interact with the receptors on the surface of the cell on this cell or the neighbouring cell, and do the same thing. They can increase cancer cell division. That means the cancer grows more because the cell cells are dividing and, and the tumour actually grows. It makes them migrate, so the tumour then actually invades into normal surrounding tissue more. And the survival means that it doesn't respond to other therapies very well. What it also does is it... it what are, this very poor diagram here is it, suggest, is it attracts new blood vessels to the tumour. That feeds the tumour even more because now the tumour is receiving uh, blood supply and nutrients and, and other things from the blood. So this one protein can set up this sort of perfect storm where it actually st stimulates growth and invasion of the tumour itself as well as you know, it, it causes uh, this 
uh, infiltration of uh, new blood vessels and makes the tumour grow even more. So we're really hopeful that, you know, if we can target this one particular protein, then we can, um, we, we can kill uh, the tumours or at least suppress their growth. What we found really is that uh, in a normal cell, we have, you know, there are many mechanisms. One of them is called this DINK protein that keeps it basically inactive. So it suppresses the activity of this SK2 protein. Stops it going to the periphery of the cell, basically keeps it in check. What we've found though is in glioblastoma is this protein, this DINK protein is lost. So again, this is just showing you, this is the levels of this DINK protein in normal brain and this is a whole lot of patients where they've, they've been assessed for the level of, of the DINK protein. And you can see that they've, uh, this is a log scale, so they've actually decreased quite a lot. In most cases, it's on average, is about 17-fold less of this protein. So from here, you go from this normal cell where, you know, you've got this DINK protein keeping everything in check. Suddenly, you go to this situation where there's no longer the DINK protein there because it's been lost for some reason. We're still trying to understand why it gets lost in, in tumours. And then suddenly, this SK2 protein is, is let free and it can go and do its, its uh, bad thing of, 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 of increasing the, the, the tumour growth and invasion. This is just to show you that it's lost in all different types of different subtypes of the glioblastoma that I talked about before. And this here is a survival, a Kaplan-Meier survival curve. So this is basically looking at survival of patients that have um, the, the low DINK. That, so, don't, so obviously there's a spectrum of, of patients. Some of them have quite reasonable levels of DINK in their tumour, others have less. So the ones that have very low levels tend to die very fast. And those that have the higher levels, so more sort of in this normal range, tend to survive better. So I really think this is a, a, a good target. This axis is a good target. We've developed drugs to this SK2 protein, and that's the really exciting thing. Um, and so we've, we've, we do a lot of structure-based drug design. So here is the, pro, here the structure of the SK2 protein. So all these little wiggly lines are essentially the, the structure of the protein. And we've been able to, to model de, or design small molecules, drugs, that can fit into the active part of the protein and basically block its action. So we look over here on the right-hand side is if this is, whoops, by my story. Um, this is looking at survival of cells in culture, of, of uh, brain tumor cells or, or glibosoma cells in culture. This is the number of percentage of cells that are alive, so they're all alive here over concentration of, of drug. So the amount of drug that we have to add to these cells. This is temozolomide. This is the current chemotherapy that's used to treat glioblastoma patients. And you can see that at no temozolomide, you have 100% of the cells survive. And as you add more and more uh, temozolomide, the cells die. But they get to a point where not all the cells have died and no more cells will die. This is huge amounts of drug. Huge amounts of drug. The amount of drug that will actually be given to a patient would be somewhere around here. So you can see that this is not, you know, not effective at all at killing these cells, even in a laboratory. This is in a sen what we can consider a sensitive set of uh, sensitive glioblastoma cells. This is what happens in a resistant. So ha about half the patients that present are actually already resistant to temozolomide. So um, you know, those cells just laugh at temozolomide. They don't even, you know, they don't die at all, pretty much. What we're really excited about is if, you know, when we look at our drugs, this is what we see. So we, our drugs just really smash these, these tumour cells incredibly well at very low concentrations. Um, and, you know, what I haven't got here, I've written at the top here, but I just realised I haven't got, is that, you know, if we combine the two drugs together, our, our inhibitor of, of, of SK2 and temozolomide, we even get better killing combined. So we can sensitise the, the tumours to temozolomide by using these inhibitors. If we take our tumour models in mice and um, we give them the, tum the, the mice tumours uh, and then we treat with our, uh, well, here's the vehicle control. So this is the, the controls, the tumour just growing and you can see it takes a little while to establish but then it just takes off. If we treat those mice, after the tumour is formed, we treat those mice with our inhibitors, we really can suppress the tumour growth uh, you know, dramatically. We don't block it all together, it is still increasing in, in size and uh, if we leave it out for a long time it will continue to, to grow in size. So it's not the cure-all yet, um, but you know, you can certainly see that this is really uh, having an effect, uh, a, a dramatic effect on the, on the tumour growth, particularly when we know that if we treat with these tumours with temozolomide we really wouldn't see much effect at all, maybe a very, very small effect.
So, you know, we're incredibly excited um, by it, but um, you know, of the potential for introducing uh, a swingers in kinase, uh, an SK2 inhibitor into a treatment regime, possibly in combination with temozolomide to start off with. Um, but, you know, uh, we, we're very excited about the prospect. But, you know, we still have a huge amount of work to do. I don't want to give anybody, have anybody leave to think that we've got the new drug that's going to go into the clinic uh, tomorrow. There's still a lot of work to do. Um, you know, we've still got to do a lot more preclinical evaluation uh, to, to, in combination with, with um, temozolomide. We've still got to try and improve these drugs. They're still not as potent and as st stable as we would like them to be. So we're working with medicinal chemists to try and actually improve on the stability and potency of these drugs. Um, they, I said they work in, in the mice, but they're not, they're not still not curing. The, the disease is still getting progression. So when we go into patients, we want to be able to really hit uh, the tumour very strongly. We, we know these drugs get across the blood-brain barrier, but we, we, we know they don't do it very well, so we need to try and improve that as well. So again, we're working with medicinal chemists to try and do that. But, you know, while there is a lot of work to do, we're still pretty excited about the prospect of, of advancing this into a therapy. And again, we're working with neurosurgeons to try and, try and bring this about. So that's my story. Um, really, the, the, this is the lab. I need to acknowledge the Neurosurgical Research Foundation, who have been fantastic in supporting some of the resources that we've developed and, and some of the funding for research. Also, the National Health and Medical Research Council have been um, very supportive in, in, in our work. The real people that need to be acknowledged here are Melinda T who, and Brioni Glidden, who is not in this picture, uh, who are the two that are really driving the, the brain tumour effort in, in my lab uh, in concert with a number of other uh, people in this picture. Um, and with that, I'd be very pleased to take any questions that you might have. Try the microphone. Uh, why is the SK2 protein there? It must have some must be there for purpose, not just to create malignant tumours, some other yeah. So other it's it, it's in. Sorry, I didn't really go into all the detail of, of, of our work, but the the SK2 protein is there. It is, it has a normal role in fat metabolism, essentially. So it all fat. So lipid. So this picture here of a cell. So this membrane that separates the outside of the cell from the inside of the cell. That's all lipids. They're all sort of breweries of fats. So each cell needs to have a lot of lipids to generate these membranes. So that's on the outside of the cell. There's also a lot of other membranes on the inside of the cell. So these need to be produced all the time to, to be able to make a cell functional. So this protein, SK2 protein, has a normal role in being able to do that. It tends to be uh, upregulated uh, uh, in cancer cells because cancer cells need to produce lots of membrane because the cells are dividing all the time. And so they need new membrane, lots of new membrane, lots of other uh, new, new lipid components. So it's part of the problem is that it gets it, it needs it needs to be there. If you if you actually remove it from uh, from cells completely, this this SK proteins completely, the, the cells die. So uh, we've done that in mice before, and if you remove all of the SK proteins, the the mice don't develop at all. They die as embryos. So you need to have some of this protein, um, but. The problem is in, in brain tumours is that you get, and, and some other cancers, you get this massive uh, activation of the protein that's beyond anything that would normally happen. And that causes this dysregulation and, and, uh, and, and this proliferate, this division of cells and this survival of cells are what not normally happen. Yeah, you know, so the idea with, the, with drug therapy, it's pretty much most drug targets that are out there for cancer really attack uh, essential proteins. But the idea is you treat it with a drug, you're going to, not be able to, the drug is never be able to be able to inhibit the protein completely. It, there will still be some level of the protein active in the cell, even with the drug therapy. So that's usually enough to keep the cell, the healthy cells, normal cells, functioning okay. Um, but the idea is that you, know, you, you, and it seems to be the case in this case, is that the the tumor cells are actually more sensitive to being to having this, this. They become dependent on this this enzyme. So once you start really heavily dependent on this enzyme, so once you start inhibiting even a little bit of it in those tumor cells. Kills the tumor cells. But a little bit in normal cell, it doesn't affect them, but it does it. A little bit of inhibition in, in tumor cell does does kill it. Some some years ago, I, I think it was on television, uh, there was a case where a person had an inoperable brain cancer. Scientists at the time doing some work with virus, and as a result of some collaboration, they were able to virus into the brain and that at least 
slowed down the growth. Is, is any work of that nature still going on? Yeah, well, that's one of the, the therapies that I mentioned um, that are sort of out there that people have done some, some work on and have got some very promising work really is this harnessing viruses to, to kill tumour cells. There are a number of different viruses that people have, have looked at. It's still early days. There's still some side effects that happen from that and it's still hard to, necessarily, to, to get the virus to um, target the tumour cells selectively and not, not the normal brain around it. Um, but there, we're not doing any of that work, but there is some really exciting work out there that uh, is in that space. We're very hopeful that might actually you know, develop further. Um, and I think the, the small trial that was done that I can think of um, recently, I think they had um, fantastic results in five patients. Um, but, you know, it's still early days with that. The blood-brain barrier is quite a problem. I wonder if you have any ideas how to come get over the blood-brain barrier or if you ever give your drugs into the cerebrospinal fluid directly so that it overcomes that yep good question so yes we um, so they used to take uh, one of the chemotherapies uh, doxorubicin or dornorubicin um, I used to put that straight into the cerebrospinal fluid uh, that's just a, 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 an old-school chemotherapeutic. So when I say old-school chemotherapeutic, many of these chemotherapies just work through attacking fast-dividing cells. Um, and so they used, before temozolomide came on to, uh, into therapy, they used to do that, uh, and that caused incredible damage to the brain. And um, it was almost worse than having the brain tumour itself. So... Um, they, they stopped doing that. But yes, there is a, there's a possibility of being able to do that. Um, still not the easiest route of being able to do it. And, and the trouble is you have fairly high concentrations of the, of the drug uh, in the brain and that can cause off-target or normal brain death. Um, but it's still a possibility. We have, yes, we have a project that we're very excited about in, in terms of uh, we've identified a... a clinically used drug that's uh, used for multiple sclerosis, actually, that um, we've found can disrupt the blood-brain barrier in a uh, transient way. So it, it disrupts it for uh, a number of hours. And uh, we're very, we just got some funding from the Neurosurgical Research Foundation to explore that and, and basically look at trying to treat um, mice harboring tumours with that drug combined with uh, other drugs that, that are very effective at killing brain tumour cells but don't get across the blood-brain barrier, so they're not used in, in therapy. Um, so that, that is uh, our hope that we might be able to do that. The, the beauty of this drug that, that we've discovered is it's very well tolerated in, in patients and it doesn't really have any other effects. Any other effects. Um, so, you know, we're quite keen on that. There are, there are other ways. There are lots, of, lots and lots of work going on in... in um, uh, around the world trying to do this. There are, uh, uh, so there are two different like, people trying to modify existing drugs so that they can now get across the blood-brain barrier uh, or people trying to modify the blood-brain barrier. One of the problems with the blood-brain barrier is it's there for a reason. So if you actually open up the blood-brain barrier to all molecules, you'll cause uh, inflammation in the brain and that can actually kill the patient. So you've got to be careful about it. That's why we're excited about this particular drug that I'm talking about because it opens up for a very short period of time. So if you can co-treat with the drug at the same time, uh, and then the blood-brain barrier closes again, it, it, it minimises the chances of getting uh, that inflammatory response. But it's still, it's untested, we don't know. It might cause more problems. I know that Stuart would be happy to answer questions over the afternoon tea break. I will just ask you, Stuart, though, can you suggest how long before you will be doing clinical trials of SK inhibitors? Oh, I hate that question. Um, you always tie me down to try and uh, look. Ballpark figure. Yeah, I'd say, look, you know, we're, we're looking a number of years. It's still years. I won't give you an actual number of years, but it's, uh, you know, uh, it, it's a number of years away. Yeah, we need to improve things. I, it looks fantastic in some of the animal models we're doing, but, you know, it, people are not animals and, uh, well, some of people are animals, but most, yeah, we're, we're not mice. 
And so we really need to improve these. And we, and we want to, when we go, in, the thing with clinical trials as well, you want to go in with the best drug that you can possibly do um, to make it successful in clinical trials. Fail. Good, responsible, and conservative answer by an excellent scientist. Thank you very much, Stuart. That's been absolutely marvellous. We do have afternoon tea now, and then when you return, we'll hear from our second eminent researcher. I do remember that you can get. Um, the record of these presentations on the university's webpage and we'll give you those details. Off to our afternoon tea. We'll see you in a few minutes. Welcome back. Welcome back and we look forward to our second eminent researcher, Professor Peter Hoffman, who will be also mentioning proteins. Proteins are really incredibly important in our lives. Um, and Proteins can be used as um, biomarkers for the early detection of disease. And, um, we're thinking now, we're hearing now about another one of those challenging cancers, ovarian cancer, where the challenge is in the early detection, whereas in the brain, brain tumours, it was in the, manage, the effective treatment. So to introduce Peter to you, just one moment. Peter is a leader in the large-scale study of proteins. It's called proteomics. And he plays a significant part in a number of organisations in a leadership position. I hope you can hear me every now and then I drop out, but with a bit of luck, you do have some notes to hand too. Peter's the Vice President of the Australasian Proteomics Society, and he's the Conference Chair for the national meeting of the Australian Society. And he's been telling me about an international proteomic society meeting, which is going to be held in Australia for the first time in Adelaide in September this year. And he's playing a key role in organising that, which says not only something about Peter himself and his research work, but also about the regard which is held both nationally and internationally. Peter's group was the first group to use mass spectrometry imaging uh, in research in large-scale study of proteins and their role as biomarkers. So this was the first time it was used in Australia. I think we're going to find that we will enjoy and really appreciate the presentation from another eminent researcher. Please help me welcoming Peter Hoffman. Okay, let's try that with this microphone. Can you all hear me? Yes? Okay, awesome. That seems to work. Hey, so what I will talk about, as you can see, is ovarian cancer. So what I will start with is tell you a little bit about the prevalence in Australia, potential symptoms, and then early detection, what is around, then a little bit what we worked on in early detection in our research, and then I take you also a little bit in potential personalized treatments is also a subject which we're working with my group on. Okay, as you can see, here's the U US cancer statistics. So uterine corpus, which is mostly ovarian, but also cervical and endometrial, are quite high after breast, lung, and colon cancer. Then the estimated death is number five, ovarian cancer. So the is relatively seldom, but the numbers of deaths occurring with that cancer is quite high. Here are the numbers from Australia. If you look at diagnosed with ovarian cancers, 1,500 females per, per year, and the estimated numbers of deaths in 2019 is 1,000. So it is a, a disease which is quite important in terms of the numbers of people who get the disease and people who come to the disease. Similar to the to brain cancer, what you can see here is that. So is if you detect it at early stage, five year survival rate is quite high. If you detect it in stage three or four, and that's where it's most of the time detected, 
the survival is quite low. As you can see at the number, it's just around 30% in stage three. Here's another graph showing you stage one. You have quite a high chance survival for a long time. Stage two is still quite good. Stage three and four is not, not great. Okay, so why is that? I'll just go a little bit in the detail why that is the case. If you are in stage one, then your tumor is restricted to the ovary. And that's then a stage where the surgeon can go in, take the ovaries out or the reproductive system, and you're fine. Okay? And, but that's seldom detected because there's no symptoms if you have a, a small tumor at the ovary. There's also the origin of ovarian cancer. There's still research going on. Does it originized from the fallopian tubes or really in the ovary? There's still ongoing research on that. And then if you go to stage two, where the tumor have spread in the fallopian tube, and that's why I got that slide up. Sometimes they think it's original in the fallopian tube. Sometimes it, they think it's original from the ovary. But if it's in that stage, you still can take the fallopian tube, the ovary is out. If, it, if there's no cells spread in the abdominal cavity, you might, be, you might be cured, and then your survival rate is quite high. If you go to stage three, then has spread in the abdominal cavity, and that is one of the problems with ovarian cancer. The ovaries are in your abdominal cavity, and each cell which can go off that tumor can float around in your abdominal cavity and can attach to other organs. So if you are in stage three, and as you can see here, then the, the, the tumors can attach to other organs. The colon is in particular bad. And then obviously the cancer has spread and it's really hard to cut that all out and give you chemotherapy and kill all those cells. Sometimes you get them all, sometimes not, and then you have a really poor survival rate, very low. Also, you can then have spread to the lymph nodes, which then places to other organs, but often it's just in the abdominal cavity and it can go to your liver, your colon, and to other important organs in your abdominal cavity. And stage four is then obviously the, the last stage where you then have distant metastasis in the bones, in the liver, in the lung, in the brain, and that's obviously the latest stage. And if you are at that stage, it's obviously your survival. Secondary tumors, yeah. Okay, so the key is moving the detection from that stage three, stage four, to the stage one, where it's restricted to the ovary, the surgery can basically cure the problem. So what are the common symptoms? So abdominal uh, girth, uh, where fluid builds up in that abdominal cavity is a, a symptom. Pelvic tumor, bowel obstruction, that is what, what are common in the advanced stage, but obviously you want to have it detected in the early stage. So what are the early symptoms? And the early symptoms are bloating, pelvic abdominal pain, change of bowel habits, constipation, urinary symptoms, so you have to go, go to the toilet often, but that's also symptoms which could be other disease, so they're often not Often people do not go to the doctor if they have those symptoms or associated with ovarian cancer. So there was a new symptoms list coming out from the US. That's just from a web page. Uh, and uh, they're trying to make it a, a little bit better so they, they make it easier. So weeing more, stomach pain, struggling to eat, bloating. That is another set of symptoms which they have identified. If you have them, you might should see a doctor and get you checked out. But again, that's also symptoms who, who can serve with other, other things. But if you are really in a risk area of ovarian cancer or in an age after menopause and you have those symptoms, you might should see a doctor. 
And that's basically the ovarian cancer Australia, which could also up those symptoms, abdominal or pelvic pain, increased abdominal size, persistent abdominal bloating, the need to urinate often or urgently, feeling full after eating a small amount. That's all those kind of symptoms which I should point you to, to go to your GP and talk about it. Okay. But I mean, if you look at some of their symptoms, 77% of female population has bloating or abdominal swelling. That would be 76.5 million over the age of 35. If you have that many women and 5.35 million, only 10,500 will be ovarian cancer. So it's not really a good indication. I mean, if you have those symptoms, please go to the GP. But uh, obviously, the try one woman with ovarian cancer for 500 women of bloating or abdominal. It's not really good as a detection, so that's the point I want to make here. So everybody is trying to find an early detection blood test or a test which you can use, especially women with risk after menopause or with other risk, but there's, there's obviously something which would be good to have to detect the disease early. There is a marker, which is around since probably more than 20 years, which is CA125. CA125 is picking up 50% of the early stages. That means it's not really a good marker for screening, but it is the only marker in the moment which is out. Um, but there's a lot of false positive results. For example, if you have endometriosis, you get a high reading of CA125. So the true usage of CA125 in the moment is if you have ovarian cancer, the surgeon operates, get chemotherapy, and then they test CA125 as a follow-up. And if CA125 goes up again, then there's a reoccurrence and you have to get in, check out, probably operate it on you again more a prognostic marker because it only picks up 50% of the early stage. Okay, so there, is a, there was a, a test developed, it's called a ROCA, and that was basically using the CE125 profile, means measuring CE125, not just once, but over a certain period of time. They used clinical data, women's age, and then family uh, risk from the family was their family members which had ovarian cancer. So they created that a numerical score who used the clinical data, the CE125 uh, profile, and used that as an early detection test. And then they used it in that UK tox study. And I'll explain a little bit what that is in a moment. That is a really large study where they followed 10,000 women over a period of 10 years. Obviously, look at those women. Some of them will develop ovarian cancer, some of them not, and then they can use that to study, obviously, screening, screening methods. And in that study, there were 296,000 screens done. 640 surgery, 133 cancer cases. So even at that 10,000 women, it's only 133 cancer. But that is the study they used to look at a test. I just have here a slide to explain you a little bit because there are uh, things coming up like sensitivity, specificity. Sensitivity is basically if you have 100% sensitivity of a screening test, then you don't miss any one. Specificity is uh, obviously, the, the how many true negatives you have. So if you have 100% specificity, you also have all people diagnosed correctly which don't have the cancer. So theoretically, the best screening test would be 100% sensitive and 100%. But that's obviously not the case, so you have the numbers. But the screening test should be in the high 90s, more or less. Otherwise, you have too much false positives and false and as you can see here, this test, which I just described to you, the OCA test, had a sensitivity of 
87%, specifically 87.6, and that MMS test, which is what often people, the, the, the oncologist do, does when they do C125 or other tests, or the people that are on risk, they do a vaginal ultrasound. Method to then pick up something else. Okay. So in that MMS test is basically using that ROCA, which uses the C125 profile, plus those medical data, plus a vaginal ultrasound, and with that together, you're coming, obviously, then to higher sensitivity and specificity. Good. But then that test was released, and that's basically how that test looks like. But then there came a paper out, which tested that over that Fox study and looked at the data from that test, how good it is, really is. And what you can see here basically is that that is obviously without any screening, and those two lines are the MMS is the WOCA test plus vaginal ultrasound. The USS is just doing the C125 normally and the ultrasound, and there was no significant difference. Basically, it, what they did with that, including the medical data and measuring the profile, was not improving over C125 and vaginal ultrasound, what they normally do. Then the FDE obviously recommended that it is not a, has not satisfied numbers that has That's the statement from the company. Okay, so is there a pro early detection test for ovarian cancer? Still not. So what we have done in our research, what we're trying to do, what is the challenge on detecting cancer early? If you detect the cancer early, is it just a tiny tumor on your ovary? You try to pick something up in, the, in your blood circulation, so it's really hard to pick that up. Blood is really complex. There are a lot of proteins in blood, so it's really hard to do that. So what we try to do is using the immune system. So if you have a tumor, hopefully the immune system builds some antibody against some protein in the tumor, which is suddenly higher abundant than before. And the immune system does that in the early stages, and that's multiplied by the immune system, so that autoantibodies, they call it, they are quite at high concentration in the bloodstream. Okay. That's what we're trying to use as our biomarker. And also antibodies are very stable in blood, and they can detect it normally with, with, a tech, with the technology like ELISA, which are very, very well known. That's just a picture from the student who worked on that, and there's some antibodies. I don't want to go into detail how we, we did a proteomic study to, to come to that autoantibodies, but I don't want to go in detail here. But we could found some three autoantibodies which give us some really good data in, in terms of sensitivity and specificity. Here you see, again, if we combine C125 with our Antibodies, autoantibodies, we get some, some quite high numbers in sensitivity and specificity, means it's a screening test. Obviously, we have done that on, a, on a case, case studies with the numbers of patients, and then we have to validate it in a higher number of patients. And the, high, the patients which we have done that is 321 cases. It's obviously not, still not high enough, but that's the number we have in the moment. That's just the numbers and the average age of the patients and how many early cages we had. That's basically the, the data from that study. As you can see, what we're seeing, for example, for that, a different regulation, especially in stage one, and then in stage two and three and four, we have not have that regulation, so that shows you that in the early stage, the immune system does that, changes and bring up that outer antibodies. And 
So we could show with that numbers of patients that it still works. And that is our rock curves or the sensitivity and specificity numbers. If we combine C125 with one of those autoantibodies, and they are already quite high, but we also have another two candidates which we can test in the moment. So what we're hoping is that with those autoantibodies, we can create an early screening test, but as I said, we have 321 patients done. We have to do it with the other, other autoantibodies, and we obviously have to really make sure that that is a test which can be used. Okay, that's uh, basically what I wanted to tell you on the research we do on an early detection test for ovarian cancer. And now I talk to you about how we use tumor spheroids and their response to treatment to develop potentially a personalized or better treatment for ovarian cancer. A bit what, what Stuart has talked a little bit about and this works also with Professor Xu Dong Wang. This is so on that brochure, and we're testing some drugs she has developed at UniSA. Okay, so first I want to explain you a little bit what are spheroids and why are they important, and then show a little bit response of that spheroids to treatment, and then show you a little bit what we have done with our mass spectrometry imaging technology, which we are leading in, in Australia. Okay, why are those spheroids important and why are they important in ovarian cancer? If you have ovarian cancer, normally if it's early stage, you have the tumor only on the ovary, but if that tumor gets bigger, cells can shed from the tumor and they float around in your abdominal cavity and normally what cells, they are not really good to survive on their own, so they cluster together in three dimensional structures and we call them spheroids. And those spheroids are floating around in your abdominal cavity, and that is a problem on ovarian cancer. They can attach to any side in your abdominal cavity and create secondary tumor. And those secondary tumor can then grow, and it's particularly bad if it's on the colon or any other organs which are important. And that's also what the problem is to cure the disease. You can cut, obviously, those tumor out, but if you have several sides of those spheroids which attach to your abdominal cavity and grow new tumors, it's really hard to cut them out. It's really hard to kill them with chemotherapy. So that's why these spheroids are important in the disease of ovarian cancer. As you could see at one of those pictures, Late stage patient with ovarian cancer, they create abdominal swelling because they have an increase of abdominal fluid, which is called ascites, and in that ascites, those spheroids float around. So, and what the surgeon often does, he drains that ascites out. It is obviously more, more comfortable then for the patient, but we can get then that ascites and filter that spheroids out, and we can use that spheroids in, in plates and can then use them to test drugs on them. And that's what, what we wanted to do, and that's what we're working in the moment, to use them as drug testing. So those spheroids, they look like that. They have an outer layer where there's highly healthy proliferating, or not healthy, but proliferating cancer cells. Then they have a a second layer where they have cancer cells which get not as much nutrition and which are in a, in a quiescent stage. And then in the middle of the spheroids are already some cells who have died and they are necrotic. But that's basically how a sphe those spheroids look like. And here you can see some pictures of that spheroids and how they grow in day one and day six. So the idea is obviously then when the, when the surgeon trained that, that ascites, that fluid, we can filter those spheroids out, we can have them in, in cell plates, and then we can test drugs on them, we can do some mass spectrometry imaging on them to see what's going on on protein level, but also where is the drug going. And if we can do that, 
we can basically develop the personalized treatment. Theoretically, you can give patients samples, spheroids, different drugs, and see which drug kills the cells the quickest, and then use that drug on that patient. Okay? That's the, the big idea behind that. So what we also have uh, developed is a, a method to grow these spheroids from, from cancer cells, from cultured cancer cells. So that's obviously where we can establish our methods that we're not taking direct patient cells from the patient because they are precious. So we have built two cancer cell lines where we create those spheroids out that we can test our methods and then we can obviously take spheroids directly from patient and test our drugs on as well. And as you can see here, that's a spheroid which is created out of OV90 cancer cell line, which is a normal cell line which a lot of researchers are using. That's the spheroids, and then we can test some drugs on them and see how quick the drug kills the spheroids, and, and that's our, our model then, and then we can transfer that to real primary cell spheroids from patients. Again, a, a schematic to do that. As said, we can do that from cell culture or from primary patients, and then we can treat them, and then we can do our protein analysis with our mass spectrometry imaging. So we can look at protein profiles and we can look at treatments and we can measure how quick the drug kills the cell in that spheroids. Why is that important? It's important because if those cells grow in that spheroids, they're much harder to kill if, they, if you would have them in normal 2D culture or if they're on their own. That's pretty much what we want to show here, where we treat those cells with carboplatin and then look how quickly they die. But the take home message is what we have done is if you treat those cells with carboplatin and you compare a normal 2D culture with that spheroids, you need much more carboplatin to kill them. That's obviously what is one of the problem in, in ovarian cancer because you have that spheroids floating around or attached to something and with that chemotherapy, at the end you're not killing all cells. That means there's still some cells around, they touch again and grow again and you have a reoccurrence. And we also tested some of Xu Dong Wang's uh, kinase inhibitor which are new, new drugs for treatment of cancer. And we also those kinase inhibitor to kill the spheroids, you need five times more drug. So you really need to have that model to really test the drugs better because the spheroids are actually what you have to kill in a patient. Okay. That's just some pictures of, uh, on the bottom here is a spheroid which is stained. And that's just showing that we over protein imaging can show you those layers of the spheroids. So there are some proteins who are highly, or highly upregulated in the necrotic part. There are some spheroids which are upregulated in that crescent part. And that's some protein marker who is more in that outer layer, which is highly proliferated. It's just to show that we can use that technology to look in those spheroids and look at spatial points of that spheroid on, on the protein level to see what's going on. Now a, a spheroid showing pretty much the same thing, but that's now a spheroid out of a patient, so it's a primary spheroid directly taken out of a patient. And here are the spheroids which we treated with one of the trucks from Chu Dong Wang, and just looking at how they get smaller after time, and we now develop also imaging methods to track how they're changing with the treatment, so we can see which one works and how quick it is working. Here's just uh, what we also can do with that technology, MALDI imaging. Here we're just showing how quick the truck penetrates that spheroid over time. So you can see no treatment. After eight hours, it's, it's outside, then it goes further in, and after 48 hours, it has even penetrated 
fully into the core of the spheroid. So with that technology, we can look at truck distribution, how quick the truck goes in, we can look at the protein profile, and we can look how quick it's going. That's really what we need as a model to really use primary spheroids from a patient to test the trucks, and obviously the dream is that is that you can take all the spheroids out, put them with different trucks, and see which truck works the best, and then give that truck that particular patient, instead of the normal thing, which is trying carboplatin or FU or other trucks until you find something which is working. Yeah, in summary, we have established a, a method to grow those spheroids, also from cell lines, but we're also taking them out of patients, and we can use our platform to look at them and test them and other imaging methods to follow up how those trucks and how quick those kills, those trucks kill the spheroids. Okay, that brings me to the end of my talk, and I just want to thank people who have data seen. Uh, postdocs have done most of the work on it. Shudong Wong has given us some of the compounds. I mostly work together with Professor Martin Oehler, which is the head of gynecology oncology at the Adelaide Hospital, so he is the clinician all those patients and operates in all those patients. We have a, a pathologist who helps us with annotations in Malaysia, and that, that's pretty much the people who have done the work. And as you heard, we have the HUPO, the International HUPO in Adelaide in September this year, which is great. And what I put up in at the end I work together with Professor Martin Oehler, and he is the clinician, he is actually a pathologist. If you have any problem with ovarian cancer, he is obviously in the Royal Adelaide Hospital, and he has a practice at Burnside. You can contact him to see I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Question that I asked Stuart, Peter: uh, How long before clinical trials? Uh, it depends. I mean, the early detection test is still. If you really want to use it as a screening test, you have to you have to test patients in the thousands. So that that's still years away because before you can really implement it. You have to do the uh, the, the method we're using for, for personalized treatment, that is, it could be closer. So what Martin has studied, for example, the PARP inhibitor is a treatment for, for ovarian cancer. With, if you have the PRCA1, PRCA2 mutation, which is a big risk, the PARP inhibitor is a treatment which that PRCA1, PRCA2 patients are getting. Also is combined with checkpoint inhibitor, which is the immune blockage of the cancer cells. So Martin has studies on those patients for those treatment. There would be obviously options to get cells from that patients and, and look at, at that beforehand. You could do that now, but there's obviously ethics applications and doing that, and uh, then for Martin, it's, it's, it's not easy. But we're working now on trying to get up testing cells with the PARP inhibitor as well, and we could combine it. We can only do it with the PARP inhibitor because the checkpoint inhibitor antibodies and they're so expensive that we can't do that. But for the PARP inhibitor alone, we could do that. What they see in the clinical study is that the PARP inhibitor is given to patients with PRCA1 and PRCA2 mutations, and it worked quite well. But what they're also now seeing is PARP inhibitor works also on some patients who haven't got the mutation. Nobody knows why, but we could theoretically test other patients, and if the PARP inhibitor works on that spheroids, it's likely that it works in the patient. But then if you can get that treatment through the TGA or not, that's another question, and that would be then also used.
can you detect spheroids at stage one ovarian cancer and therefore have a, a possibility of cure? Or it can, can be... Oh, no, no, you can't. So it's mostly the, you take the spheroids. The sciatus will probably only build it, be built it up in later stage. Sometimes you have earlier sciatus, but that would be very seldom. If you have a sciatus, your spheroids float around. It has to be very lucky that you have a sciatus and they float around. They haven't attached to anything. That, that would be the only way where you could pick it up that early and then test them. Thank you for your presentation. It's very interesting. Um, would you think it would be a good idea for women of a certain age, say 60, have a euphorectomy as an aid to successful aging? Dif difficult question, and probably is more a question Martin would be better, the clinician would be better to answer. Uh, the only thing I can see from the literature is if you have the PRCA1, PRCA2 mutation, that's the Angelina. A Jolie case, I would definitely say yes. If you, I mean, and that's what Angelina Jolie has done. You have your kids, you get it removed to, because you have a high risk of breast cancer and ovarian cancer, PACA1, PACA2 mutation. The, the, the risk after menopause is higher, but to get then that surgery done, I think it's, it would be, yeah, you could. Uh, the question is if the health insurance would pay for it. Probably not because the... <laughs> oh, look, I mean, what, what I say to, to people who have a high risk, let's say they have a mother who died on ovarian cancer or an aunt, just get C125 and vaginal ultrasound done every six months. But look, if you can discuss with your surgeon, if you want to do that, I would say the health insurance would not pay for it. But I'd like to know um, if you had a child who would now be Old, and you'd had a baby before that and been given still bestrol to suppress the milk if you're having trouble feeding. Uh, and then they were told that having taken that drug, that their a subsequent female baby could run the risk of ovarian cancer. Does that theory still stand? What, say, say it again. What was the treatment? Still bestrol. Still bestrol, it was called. I may have the wrong pronunciation. But it was given to mothers who couldn't breastfeed, and it was to suppress the the milk. I can't answer that. I have to ask Martin <laughs> about that question. He would be able to answer that question. Uh, I I don't know. I, I haven't looked into that. Probably email Martin that question, and he. I'm not familiar with that. Yeah. No, it's, it's more that, I mean, the idea is more that the, the chrism part in the middle survives better the chemotherapy than others. So that the, because they are not proliferating, and if, if some of those cells not got hit by the chemotherapy, and, and they, they survive then. So that, that's the COB behind. They don't have a film which protects them, but because the outer proliferating cells, they take the drug up and they get killed. And then the prison cells, they take it up slower and they might survive and then they might be in the necrotic part, some cells which are not dead yet and they can't be hit by the drug and they survive. But we also looking into that, we, what we're doing with the drug, we're looking how quick they get smaller 
Do they kill all the cells? Are there cells coming off who still survive? We're looking at all those in things. In because it's not 100% known why at the end some cells survive and you have a reoccurrence. Um, does an ovarian cyst often turn into a malignant cancer or what, what's the relation between a ovarian cyst that's probably persisted for a while and not done much? Um, is it likely to evolve into a something malignant? As my understanding go, no. Uh, normally cysts are more benign and yeah, they will get taken out at some stage, but yeah. Um, I just was wondering with the ovarian cancer, if you've had endometriosis, what's the likelihood of uh, getting ovarian cancer later down the track? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it's probably, as far as I remember, I, d I don't but I'm not 100% sure, would probably a uh, question Martin could answer better than me, but my understanding is no, as far as I remember. But I'm, not, I'm not the clinician, I'm the basic researcher, together with the clinician, and often we rely obviously on his expertise, or we meet with him once a week. And I try to actually get him to give the first half of my talk, but he is often working really hard. It seems to me that it's one thing to deliver the drug to a spheroid in a test tube, but how do you do it in the body? Yeah, that's a good question. So there are methods, I mean, normally they give the chemotherapy intravenous, but there is a, a method which Martin has also tried out. They basically try also to go in the abdominal cavity and then they have a device who sprays it with pressure into the abdominal cavity and spray the drug around. And that's things which they're trying in the moment. There are clinical trials on it and it looks promising, but it's also not as promising as they hoped. It doesn't make that much difference to giving the chemo. But they're working on those methods to improve the delivery to the truck to the abdominal cavity to kill all the cells. Sorry? Exactly, yeah. And that's why we're trying to take those cells out and try to try to do all, all sorts of tests on them and help them with the treatment. You might have mentioned, or might have as far as treatment's concerned, um, are you getting a number of different targets, um, drugs, or um, only one type of cancer cell? Yeah, in the moment, in the moment, most of the treatment is the traditional chemotherapy carboplatin, FU, and then there's obviously new drugs developed like the kinase inhibitors and trying to develop really targeted drugs to the disease, uh, but they are not out yet apart from the olapirib, which is the PARP inhibitor, and that's a targeted drug to people with PRCA1, PRCA2 mutation, yes. Yep. Does that mean there are only two? That doesn't answer the question. What I'm getting at is um, are there more than two types of cancer cell. Are you picking up okay. lots of different types of protein or just the two? There's, there's a genetic, this, there, there's also ovarian cancer is not ovarian cancer. So what we're talking about is serious ovarian cancer. It's probably, uh, of the cases are serious, but there's clear cell ovarian cancer and other types of ovarian cancer. They, are, they did a genetic study where they distributed, find out there's five types of ovarian cancer. Most of the drugs are obviously developed against that form of serious ovarian cancer because that's the highest rate. But for example, I know in the 
Asian region, the clear cell is higher than in the Caucasian, it's still the series is still the highest. So there's people in Singapore who are working on drugs which are more for the clear cell. So there, there are five different types of ovarian cancer, different cells, where they try to find, obviously, specific treatment for different types of ovarian cancer. Now, I give talks like that. I mostly talk about the serious ovarian cancer because that's the highest uh, Caucasian, that's 80% of the cases. But yeah, they, are, they think there's five different types, but there's three which are really well known and two which are not so well known. And the numbers obviously goes down. The serious is the highest, the clear is the second highest, and the other is the lowest. They are different cells and would need probably different drugs to treat them. Questions, just before I thank our speakers on your behalf, I want to mention the next Successful Aging Seminar, which is on the 27th of September. It's going to be on superbugs and new drugs. Now, I, I'd like you to, to join me in thanking our two eminent researchers. So much has been achieved, but so many challenges remain. We'll invite them back in a few years' time to hear how things are going. Thank you both very much. Thank you very much.